Everybody hold on to your seats. More colossal than a roller coaster. A bigger rush than free falling. <laughs> cool. The thrill ride of your life isn't at any amusement park. Do they think I'm doing this for fun? But it's yours to give. Speed, now on video cassette. Buy the ultimate gift. Give it for $19.98 or less. <laughs> It's Die Hard on an Elevator, Die Hard on a Bus, and Die Hard on a Subway. We are talking about the Speed Movie franchise, which later includes Die Hard on a Slow-Moving Cruise Ship. Hi, my name is Johnny Patoki. You may know me from the Attack of the Bee Movies podcast. I've also uh, worked on some of these shows before. It's been a while. been a long time. So when I was asked to come here and talk about how great the movie Speed was and how quote-unquote hysterical Speed 2 is... I couldn't turn it down, because Speed's one of my favorite movies from when I was a teenager. It's a great flick. It's a 1994 movie, for those of you that don't know, starring Keanu Reeves, Sandra Bullock, Jeff Daniels, Dennis Hopper, and Joel Morton. Really good cast. It's directed by Jan de Bont. I don't know if I said that right. Written by Graham Yost. He sounds familiar. I can't place him, though. It, it's a 1994 action movie about a bomber that pretty much got feels he got screwed and he wants to um, exact revenge and get ransom money and whatnot. So the movie opens, and we have Jack, who's played by Keanu Reeves, and we have Harry, who's played by Jeff Daniels, and they are trying to disarm a bomb that is hooked to an elevator with 13 people in it, being held ransom for $3 million, a guy named Howard Payne. Howard Payne is played by Dennis Hopper, perfectly by Dennis Hopper. Dennis Hopper, when I was younger, I didn't really know much about him because a lot of his movies from the 60s and 70s, and I hate to admit it, but a lot of movies from the 60s and 70s for me, especially then, were a hard watch. Some are now, too, to be fair. So I didn't really know much about him. He plays a fantastic bad guy in this. Really good. He's watching this, this happen from afar. Uh, they defuse the bomb. a corner Payne, and Payne gets the upper hand and takes Harry hostage. This day has been real disappointing, I don't mind saying. Why, because you didn't get to kill everyone? There will come a time, boy, when you'll wish you never met me. Mister, I'm already there. See, I'm in charge here. I drop this stick, huh? And they pick your friend up with a sponge. Are you ready to die, friend? Fuck you. <laughs> oh, in 200 years, we've come from my regret, but I have one life to give for my country to fuck you. So I believe Harry kind of says, they were talking about something earlier in the movie, and he goes, what do you do? And he goes, you shoot the hostage and take the hostage out of the equation. I don't remember, I'm paraphrasing a bit. So in this, there, he's got Harry, and he's holding Harry for trying to escape, and <laughs> Jack, a.k.a. Keanu Reeves, shoots Harry in the leg, dropping him to the ground, and now Payne doesn't have any protection. So he shoots the hostage, which if you've ever heard the phrase shoot the hostage, it's because of this movie. You shot me. I can't believe it. I'm giving you a medal for shooting me, you little prick. Harry, you told me to. So uh, Payne detonates a bomb, and they all think he's dead. Yada, yada, yada. Uh, a couple days later, a bus explodes in L.A. Cops trying to figure out what's going on, and then they get contacted by Payne. And Payne says basically that... He wants $3.7 million. If he doesn't get this money, this another bus will explode. The trick with this bus, though, is that bomb is triggered to arm when the bus exceeds 50 miles per hour and detonate if it gets below 50 miles per hour, hence name speed. So in L.A. and a lot of big cities, sometimes buses go on the freeways. And Keanu Reeves is racing to this bus trying to get there before this, bu this bomb arms. Unfortunately, he doesn't make it, and he does get on the bus after 50 miles per hour fantastic scene of the bus and him. Well, the bus is just going straight at this point. Like, nothing is out of ordinary to the people on the bus. But the racing to the bus scene and him getting onto the bus, 
Very excellent scene. The stunts in this movie are top-notch to me. Special effects are pretty damn good. And it honestly feels like, even though it's an action movie, it feels very much along the caliber to me of, like, Die Hard with a Vengeance, which I thought was a great movie. It knows what it is, and it's not trying to feel too real, but you could see some of this happening. It's not It's not bad. So Jack gets on the bus, and the bomb had already armed. The bomb armed just just before he got there. So there's this, this there's a felon on board for some reason that thinks Jack's there to arrest him, which, come on, like, really? He, you're going to risk your life jumping onto a bus at 50 miles per hour for that? So he starts shooting, he takes out the bus driver. reason this part is relevant is because this is when Sandra Bullock comes into play. Sandra Bullock had some experience driving a bus, and uh, her name's Annie, Annie Porter, and she is fantastic. First off, I just love it. Sandra Bullock. Let me get that out there. I still do. I think she's great i think she's you know attractive i think she's a great actress i think everything she seems like a really nice person i could be wildly wrong but yeah who knows so you're a cop right that's right well i should probably tell you that i'm taking the bus because i have my driver's license revoked what for speeding she wants to slow down the bus so they can get help for the bus driver and jack says no we can't do that and then he's forced to tell them that there's a bomb on the bus now of course the passengers aren't happy about this so Jack crawls under the bus, holding on to, like, like through a hatch, and he crawls under there holding on to stuff, and he calls Harry while he's down there, and they're um, talking about the type of bomb it is, and the police department tells him, hey, there's an unopened section of freeway, go there, you know, that way there's no other people in danger other than the bus and Jack. And uh, the police the police chief, who I think is Joe Morton, is a guy named Mac. He's demanding to pay. And, hey, we we want to offload these passengers. Mac tells Kenna Reeves to offload the passengers, and then he's like, "Well, we can't because if we do, Payne's watching, and if he sees it happening, they'll he'll blow it up." Okay, Jack, this is it. Don't get dead. So Payne, for some reason, keeps calling Jack directly. I don't remember why. I think it's just a mess with him. Jack, nothing tricky now. You know that I'm on top of you. Do not attempt to grow a brain. Jack and him discuss letting the bus driver be evacuated because he got shot. And another really cool scene. The vehicle pulls up next to the bus. They're getting him across the, out across the bus. Now, I don't know what speed these guys were actually driving at, but it's a very good, it's a very nice, well-done sequence. Uh, plus, in the process, this woman tries to escape, and as she tries to escape, a smaller bomb by the door explodes. So, you know, that's pretty intense. So you have little stunts here and there like that. Keanu Reeves' chemistry with Sandra Bullock I think is great. I thought all the, I thought the chemistry with all the leading actors in this movie and actresses, leading thespians, I guess, whatever, I, th- I thought it was really good. And it was enjoyable. And it was a fast-paced, fun movie to watch. So at this point, now they find out, hey, the freeway ends. How are we, they got to get across this gap. This is the scene we all know and love. Even if you've never seen Speed, you've probably seen this or seen it recreated. Mythbusters did it even. And they... um. He convinces her to accelerate, and she accelerates, and they jump this gap with a bus. Awesome. Like, totally far-fetched, but come on, that's pretty awesome. And I will say, I want to throw this in there. I think action movies peaked in the the 80s and 90s with this kind of stuff. And by the mid-2000s, they just didn't have it to me anymore. It was all about gunplay and, like... I mean, the fight scenes are great, don't get me wrong. And there are some good action movies. John Wick, those are great. But I think, for me, the pinnacle, the best action movies to this day are B-movies right now. But anyways, but this feels, I mean, this was great at the time. The bus jumps it, they, they finish it. Um, they end up going to the L.A. airport so they can go, like, in a big circle and keep it about 50 miles per hour on the runways. They also find out that this guy, Payne, is watching them through the camera on the bus. This is pretty ahead of its time because... Some of the things in this movie, technology-wise, were a little bit ahead of their time. Not that they couldn't be done, but to watch people live like that was a little ahead of its time. And then um, they use a um, they use a news copter to intercept the feed that the guys that Payne's watching, and they loop the feed while Keanu Reeves goes under the bus again, try to disarm it, but something happens and it doesn't work out. So. They have this news crew looping the data transmission, which is awesome. Like, the news crew's like, yeah, we'll help out. Nowadays, they'd be like, no, we want to see the carnage and the blood and guts when it all explodes. Because, you know, that's the world we live in. So, 
he couldn't he couldn't um so they, they get another vehicle and they get the vehicle next to the bus they're doing 50 miles per hour and they offload all the passengers and then jack and uh annie end up having to escape through a floor access panel the bus hits a boeing 707 i think it is explodes strap I mean, great explosion again the whole thing it, i can't even do it justice it's that good of an action scene this they the movie is almost two hours long, and it feels it goes by so fast because it's such a fast-paced movie. Again, Payne escapes. They're all waiting for him. They're trying to bust him again. He escapes. You're crazy. You're fucking crazy. Oh, no. Poor people are crazy, Jack. I'm eccentric. And it turns out he kidnaps Annie, and he hijacks the subway train, kills the driver, and he puts a vest on Annie that has a pressure switch that he's holding. If he lets go, Annie blows up and dies. She's chained to a subway pole. Him and Jack start fighting on top of the subway train, which is awesome. It's a great fight sequence. Granted, I always wonder in these movies how, like, the pr- prime of their life, like 30-some-year-old, twenty late 20s, early 30s, real fit guy, has issues with, like, a 70-year-old geriatric, but whatever. I'm the guy with the plan, because I'm smarter than you. I'm smarter than you. As they're fighting... Jack kind of holds him up while he's trying to, like, strangle him, and Payne gets decapitated. Yeah? Well, I'm taller. By a, a train signal. The trigger never goes off, and he's safe, except for the fact that now the train has run away. It's heading towards a construction site, I think, and Annie can't get free because she's handcuffed to the pole. Payne died, had the keys. The decapitation is, I mean... It's not super gory, but it's awesome. I mean, what a way for the bad guy to go, you know? So to save Annie, they speed the train up as fast as it can go so it jumps the track and derails, thinking that would be safer than what's going to happen if it doesn't. So it derails, crashes in the construction area. At this point, Jack had already deactivated the vest, too. I might want to add that in there. I want to say this movie had a lot of cut the blue wire, too. It's been a while. I haven't watched it in a few years. I might watch it after this. So they jump the track, go through a construction site, and it ends up on Hollywood Boulevard. Kind of a cool scene. And um, Jack and Annie kiss, and everyone's looking surprised and watching what happens. I've heard relationships based on intense experiences never work. Okay. We'll have to base it on sex, then. Whatever you say, ma'am. Overall, this is a great movie. I love this movie. But still, it was a good movie. Uh, there were some other notable actors in it. Alan Ruck was in it. Oh, darn. It was just, I just thought it was a great movie. And it was kind of like, it was similar to the movie Runaway Train with John Voight, I guess, in a way. Well, at least the ending was. But, I mean, this, the concept has gone, you know, has been around for a long time. But, honestly, the, it's just great. The special effects were good. The acting was was solid. The the writing was good. The, there were a few twists and turns in the plot that were good. Uh, we find out something I forgot to mention is you find out he's a jilted Payne was a jilted Atlanta LA or Atlanta SWAT cop, and this is why he was taking you know revenge. Uh, they they actually filmed it on some of the actual highways and stuff. LA the movie even got great reviews. Also won like a bunch of different awards from different associations. The Academy Award for Best Sound Effects Editing. It was nominated for Best Film Editing. It won Best Sound from the BAFTA Awards. It won Best Editing at the BAFTA Awards. It won Favorite Actress at the Blockbuster Entertainment Awards. When that used to be, That's an old sentence, isn't it? It had been nominated and won a bunch of awards. A lot of it was for sound editing, but it was nominated for Best Movie, Best Performance, even MTV, which I know that you know, it's MTV. It had won a good amount of awards. Dennis Hopper actually won Best Villain for it. So it was a, it was a good flick. We'll return after these messages. If you like small town mystery, crazy news, and wild history, then the Florida Men on Florida Man podcast is for you. Each week, Josh Mills and Wayne McCarty bring you the absolute best Florida has to offer. So if you're looking for a show that's safe for the family, but funny enough to help you escape everyday life, then listen to the Florida Men on Florida Man podcast. That's Florida Men, plural, on Florida Man Podcast. Hey, it's Brent Pope, the host of Breakfast with Brent Pope. You've seen me on some of your favorite TV shows saying things like, give it up, Jimmy. You got to sink this putt to win. 
On Breakfast with Brent Pope, I sit down with guests from the entertainment world and we do it all over breakfast. Or should I say breakfast? Every week on Breakfast, you get inside Hollywood info and tips, great breakfast wrecks and foodie debates. Most of all, you get the most delightful 30 minutes of your week. So dig in. It's breakfast time. Listen at breakfast.com, Apple Podcasts, or wherever fine podcasts are found. The Jacked Up Review Show podcast is honored to be part of the Blind Knowledge Podcast Network. Join anytime, talk the talk, and enjoy yourselves. There's something enlightening for everyone with this crowd of cool cats. Check them out. Here back is the movie and action elites, Jonathan Mark. Welcome. Always glad to be here. Uh, I'm your host, Sully, and we got some exclusive trivia from the recent podcast, 50 Miles Per Hour, formed in 2023. It has interviewed all kinds of people involved with the making of these awesome blockbuster movies, so I'll be sharing some of those cool facts. So, this franchise stars Joe Morton from The Brother from Another Planet in Executive Decision in T2 as Lieutenant Mack. It also stars veteran bad guy Dennis Hopper as Howard Payne in a cool comeback role, but it's mainly best known for making mega stars out of Keanu Reeves of Point Break and Bill and Ted fame, as well as Sandra Bullock, who would later grace our screens with blockbusters such as Gravity, the Miscongeniality films, and uh, lo and behold, other Oscar bait movies like Crash. So what was your intro to this movie? It was always on everywhere. AMC, USA Network, FX, since it was a Fox movie. And that's how I watched it. It was yeah, just it coming on FX all the time. When I was nonstop. A kid. It's really yeah. pretty brutal at the same time without being too much, unlike some movies where if you just modify it one way, you're killing the enjoyment. But like, there's not too much the language is very infrequent and it really only gets that r just because of the security guard stabbed in the face at the beginning and beth grant's character jumping off the bus and getting run over yeah that's so, pretty much why very cool trivia again you know it just they were making a diehard type movie and lo and behold the production designers worked on this so they worked in the same pacific union transport bus company that they used in diehard one and free <laughs> so it's kind of in this universe of valverde uh, before we get into this, what are some other similar movies to Speed that you would also recommend? This, this one has inspired more than we realize, whether it's some other infamous bomber movie like Blown Away or even uh, Terminator Genesis. <laughs> you know the scene. <laughs> I was about to mention Blown Away as they came out. Uh, it came out around the same, time. the same time. Yeah. yeah. Grammy Oz took a similar story with Broken Arrow and Die Hard Free was reworked to be very much like this, as well as the siege with Denzel Washington and just about any season of 24 has similar kind of yeah. tension. Uh, just it, it seems like it was kind of the one up of, of all these Die Hard clones. If you weren't trying to be like Die Hard, then you wanted something like Under Siege or something like True Lies or even The Rock, you know, with Sean Connery and yeah. Nick Cage. Oh, I do have one fact I should mention Oh, about this movie that I do know. Because I remember... Years ago, on the Action Elite site, when Jeff Speaker was interviewed, that this was originally the mm -hmm. his film. Absolutely, he, he had a bad Paramount. agent, and he lost. He lost it, especially once it moved from Paramount to Fox. <laughs> yeah, and made a star out of producer Mark Gordon, who has yes. gone on to produce other blockbuster movies like The Patriot and Saving Private Ryan, as well as mega you know tv franchises like ray donovan criminal minds and Grey's anatomy <laughs> uh, I, I love how it's been referenced any everywhere you know we, we already talked about some of the other things there was that melissa mccarthy episode of snl where is like the skit ends once the bomb the bus blows up uh jurassic yep. park 2 is a total nod at the very end <laughs> jen debont kind of uses similar tension in his follow-up blockbuster movie twister uh, this constantly makes so many uh, best movies of all time lists and <laughs> favorite Definitely disaster so. movies. But yeah, well, as we go on, I'll I'll mention uh, 50 Miles Per Hour, the recent podcast that talks about the mega hit. So what's your favorite standalone line from this? There's so many to choose. <laughs> I'm going to rip out your fucking neck. <laughs> Pop quiz hot shot, obviously, has been referenced in the Mercenaries video game. <laughs> That's always been my favorite. It's probably <laughs> Uh, I, I personally love it when the partner uh, Jeff Daniels uh, as Harry goes, I'm going to go home and have some great sex. 
<laughs> I forgot about that line. He's, he's getting all drunk and he's like, you're really a piece of work, Jack. Right. I'm gonna go home, have some sex. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, you're gonna go home and puke. Yeah, well, that'll be fun too. Uh, it's a dynamite movie. I watch it, even a portion of it. I will just stop down and watch it anytime it's on. I see people trying to wreck it and I'm like, no, fuck you. Do not do this to me. You, know, you are not going to wreck this mega movie hit. <laughs> just... Of course, they try to wreck it because people love to rag on Johnny's acting, even though <sighs> this was a chance for him to shine, not just to play. Especially when Jan DeBon said in did. recent interviews how he toned him down significantly. He was going Shakespearean style, and he's like, "That's you're too intense. You're, I don't want you to be all Shatner. Just... Tone it back a bit. And considering the amount of uh, research he did, you know, uh, Sandra Bullock took some driving lessons and he decided to mm -hmm. just look at some bike cops and he real he even suggested changes. He's like, no, no, this guy wouldn't be a hot shot. He'd be a yes sir, no sir kind of guy. And obviously, you know, Point Break's fine. It's like like you, I don't think it's it would be somewhere in his repertoire of awesome movies. But to me, he'll always be Neo Anderson and Jack Travin from Speed and Ted. <laughs> And John Wick, obviously yeah, now, John Wick, yeah. Uh, but even his one-off movies like Siberia, Chain Reaction, and Man of Tai Chi are worth a watch. Um, and Constantine, as I always mentioned, Constantine, he's mm -hmm. having fun in that. Uh, and Bond was, you know, great cinematographer. Worked for James Foley, Joel Schumacher, and mainly John McTurnan and Paul Verhoeven. Uh, I was gonna and, say because he was the cinematographer for Die Hard. Absolutely, and. And just uh, Lethal Weapon Free was the last one he shot before he made his directorial debut. And Mark Gordon had to actually beg him to come back to the pitching meeting just because he was so nervous. And they're like, hey, well, he's a good talent. You don't have to get all worked up by how he's stalking and everything. You just got to listen. Um, he was originally attached to Helm Drop Zone with Wesley Snipes the year later. Uh, oh, wow. That was getting retooled. And Speed almost, when it was that Paramount, Thank God this didn't happen. It almost got conceived as the third Beverly Hills Cop at Paramount. That would not have worked. I don't think it would have worked for Axel Foley. I'm sorry, guys. I love him to death, but man. No, that... Studio executives. And this is not on IMDb, I swear. This is all recent, recent shit on this podcast. Uh, they originally wanted Charlie Sheen to play Jack and Holly Berry to play Annie. And Holly Berry... You know, Charlie was not interested. He already done hot shots for Fox and wanted something else. And Holly kicked is kicked herself sideways because she, you know, the what was on the script was not very necessarily impressive. The producers liked it because it was a fun kind of pot boiler. Yeah. Uh, Rennie Harlan was attached. He wasn't interested. Dwight H. Little. I can see Rennie Harlan. Yeah. Yeah, and Dwight H. Little suggested the rear projection, which they did not use until they were doing the subway scene where they were showing at least something projecting in the background. Hmm. And Mark Gordon said this best. is like, we considered Michael Bay before he was Michael Bay. <laughs> <laughs> so he did Bad Boy well, Junior later. Kind of amazing, but, you know. I think he would have had fun never... with it, but he would have been yeah. very careless at the same time. Yeah. Which is okay, because that's what Michael Bay kind of is. He's a shame... To me, he's just like Stallone, where he's very shameless and ego-driven. Devant just kept getting passed around, and finally they said yes. The only thing that he added, the director, was the bus jump. <laughs> and he did that I during the pitch meeting, yep. and I just find it interesting. It's like, that that is his identity. He's like, we cannot have that without that. Further on, while they were still having trouble with getting the leads, William Baldwin was runner-up. You know, he'd just done flatliners and backdraft. They also considered Michael Madsen, but Fox vice president mm. Peter Chernin was very unimpressed with how he looked to where he then offered him the role of the villain on the spot. And Madsen being all confused, he's like, is my agent or you playing a trick on me? I'm going to pass. <laughs> it was making me nervous. <laughs> I love you, Madsen. But yeah, no, you would not have been right for this. <laughs> you wouldn't have had the charisma. I could, have seen it, cause I could have seen him as a villain, not so much Jack Trabin. That so. or maybe one of the SWAT hotheads. Say, jump, just jump. But I don't know. Jack Trabin was originally a character that was originally made to be a hotshot cop before they made him be more of a reserved, polite SWAT guy. And Annie 
It was originally supposed to be a pain med addicted ambulance driver <laughs> before they made her be a civilian <laughs> who lost her driver's license. Now, I had no idea, but apparently on one of the mini DVDs, Blu-rays before the more recent one, they had some deleted scenes. And in one extended scene, she she reveals herself to be a graphic designer. And that, that made better sense to me because I would always see that on the websites. I'm like, I don't recall her saying that anywhere in the movie. What am I missing? <laughs> oh, <I'm sorry. laughs> Graham Yoss recalled that when he had Jeff Daniels' SWAT partner, Harry, he originally had him in an earlier draft that he was going to be the actual bomber. Like, he got all angry that Jack, you know, injured a civilian. He got all fed up and disillusioned. And fortunately, that never made it Jeff Daniels' way. His issue was on one of the earlier drafts that his character dies in the very opening elevator rescue. And mm. he's like, I'll do it, but you got to have me die way later. And Josh Whedon That's added yeah. the dialogue. I loved how in those recent interviews for 50 miles an hour, how Daniels revealed how he was inspired by Roy Scheider looking at the shark in Jaws. He had seen him in an interview talk about that, and that's what he was inspired by, how he's just looking like he's accepting death while he's looking it in the face during his final moment. <laughs> but good on him for taking a chance on this, because he had just done, you know, Broadway plays that no one had seen, other indie, smaller pictures, comedies, but he just wrapped Dumb and Dumber against his agent's, you know, recommendation, but it wasn't going to be out till the fall. Yeah. This fortunately got him his gig hosting SNL that year. So, good year for him. Also, Walter Parks Jr., I think is his name. He's worked on movies like Sneakers and what have you and War Games. He was one of the other executives helping them with the rewrites. And he, he also was noting how, again, yeah, we got to have there be a death later in the movie. Otherwise, we're going to rob ourselves of dramatic reward. And he was feeling that since much like Die Hard, this was inspired by 70s disaster movies. He was inspired by the movie Juggernaut, which if anyone has seen with Anthony Hopkins, that is a very awesome Richard Fleischer, you know, uh, diffusing a bomb on a cruise liner ship uh, storyline. And uh, you can totally see some speed in, in that movie. One of the other rewriters is Paul Antonaccio, who people might know it later went on to be the lead writer on House and was one of the co-creators on Homicide Life on the Street. Apparently, he got paid a shit ton of money, like 12K or something, and everyone hated all the changes he made like he changed the names and unfortunately that's what caused some disdain with the uh, various actors playing the bus passengers because they had more momentum they had more uh, material to work with and that went away so then jan debont had to have a lot of ad-libbing he's like i swear you're not going to be a featured actor you you do have a purpose in this movie you know <laughs> and we've just filmed stuff with you so we're not going to reshoot it or recast it but graham yas got hired back to rewrite and undo all the changes so fortunately he can still claim the movie is as much his you know you'll love this originally they introduce dennis hopper's character howard payne as a douchebag like guy at a bar and he, he stabbed a punk in the face with a pencil <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> yes it just sounds like an awful simpsons episode it's like what the fuck and uh <laughs> the podcasters believe that might have been paul antonaccio's changes he was unsure if he added a stabbing but both writers is like yeah no we did not fucking add any stabbing where the hell's that coming from <laughs> other people in jeopardy are of course the passengers of the bus held hostage at the whim of a madman now if you've been with us you've seen the the whim of a madman. <laughs> I like that. Most of the dialogue does seem to be Antonasio's and regarding Howard Payne. Uh, but Hopper still has some moments here and there, especially when he's at the terminal as his TV screen watching the action. And Jen Debon, of course, encouraged that. I'm glad that they passed on Charles Grodin being the villain. That was Josh Whedon's idea. He wanted a beloved character actor to be mm -hmm. the villain. And I'm like, yeah, no, I don't see Grodin. I don't see that. that. Maybe as a sociopath or a cynic, but not, not an evil douchebag blowing people up. Um, Ed Harris was brought in and passed twice as he did not want to be in an action movie starring someone from Bill and Ted. Wow. This was okay. back when Harry was still written as the traitor, though, so he might not have liked that either. But all good. So tell me what you think of these actors who were offered $5 million to play the villain role. But they all passed because they didn't see much to it. Okay. Christopher Walken. I could probably see that. Maybe. I can see that. Sean Penn. <laughs> no. <Hell> no. <laughs> Kurt Russell. I would have been cool, but 
I don't know. I felt like he would have been typecast as a villain from that point on, as opposed to yeah, Harrison Ford say. type anti-hero roles. He got Tim Roth. Eh, that would have mm. been two Patriot Games knockoff, I think. For... <laughs> I prefer him in roles yeah. where you don't know what he is. Plus, we wouldn't have gotten him in Pulp Fiction. Alan Rickman. That's too obvious, though. Yeah, it would have been like, yeah, he would have definitely been in direct video hell by that point. Robert Duvall, I'm unsure of. I love him to death, but nah, I don't get it. Same here. Yeah, I don't know about villain. Especially this villain. Mm-hmm. Now, the director found Gary Oldman to be a good pick, but too typical and wanted him to be a non-typical pick, but the producers were adamant about it. And you'll find this funny. Someone who later came in and this franchise, William Defoe, was offered. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that's not a surprise. Uh, I'm glad he was in part two because he made that one way more watchable. Jeff Bridges yeah. and Kevin mm. Klein again. Kevin Klein, I love you, Kevin, but as the villain, a, I don't be an action movie. Come on, no. <laughs> you're a dramatic, comedic actor like Fish Called Wanda. You know, <laughs> so producer Mark Gordon and director Jan DeBont wanted Randy Quaid. Hear him out. At this time, they just found him an interesting character actor, but the studio considered him a comedy guy wrong for the part. Thank God the studio had some sense. He was similarly. Yeah. He was in the writer's other movie, Hard Rain, but he worked there. I, I see him totally as. Yeah, a, he worked sh- better as that character. Than yeah, uh, you, you got to be a sheriff or a crazy NRA guy. You can't be. <laughs> it can't be just a crazy madman hamming it yeah. up. <laughs> so. Dennis Hopper was picked number 44 on the list. 44? He was the 44th pick. Man. Jeff Goldblum is rumored to have been considered, but that trivia could not be confirmed according to the podcast. So (laughs) here's where it gets even wilder. So Jeff Daniels' character, Harry, originally his surname is Sears in the script, and they changed it to Temple later on. Again, it's just amazing how this was a nothing burger of a job, and it ended up being getting him some extra work, showing he could do drama and blockbuster movies. Joe Morden, that's that's right, Lieutenant Mack, was coincidentally trained by the same SWAT stunt team that shot him in Terminator 2. But, yes. I didn't know. <laughs> he envisioned his character as some kind of Vietnam War veteran, and he looked for all kinds of advice from the guys, since it was very unlikely there would be probably a black man you know, lieutenant in charge of an L.A. SWAT team at that time. But he just wanted to just, you know, make a positive character, much like the guys on the bus. They didn't want to be playing stereotypes or hicks or gangbangers, you know, (laughs) baby mamas. So good on them. They all stuck to their guns and just said, hey, can you reword this a bit? (laughs) I definitely rate these not only in some of my top 10 favorite movies, but definitely top 10 action. Like, I can't imagine this movie not being out there somewhere. I've shown it to siblings, I've shown it to family, and even if they find it unintentionally cheesy at some points, there's just something about it they just find emotionally riveting. Even family members I know who don't care for action movies generally like this one. There's just something about the characters that stand out. I think it's in your top 100 movies. Like It is easily in my top 10 action films, especially for the 90s at the time. I used to it own the soundtracks. It had a lot of exclusive pop songs that weren't in the movie. <laughs> Most of the score by Mark Mancino. Intense. That's another thing. That it's been used in countless trailers that people won't realize. For <laughs> Annie, it was the right place. Who's ready to party on the big boat beside me? With the right guy. This almost seems too perfect, doesn't it? At exactly the wrong time. Again. Oh, man! A position charges throughout the ship. I've been in worse situations than this. A panicking does not help. Trust me. Are you going to stop me now, my friend? Yes, Speed 2 Cruise Control. I am never leaving the house again. Rated PG-13. Rush Hour hits the water June 13th. Ah, now we get to Speed 2. Now, I remember reading why Speed 2, why Keanu Reeves didn't want to do it. And I don't recall exactly what the problem was. Or what, I I don't remember if it was because he didn't like the the plot or what, I don't remember exactly what it was. So they replaced him with Jason Patrick. Nothing against Jason Patrick. I like him in a lot of things. And the bad guy in this one is William Dafoe. And William Dafoe plays a fantastic bad guy. I spent a great many years developing computer systems for these cruise lines, including this baby. And then I got tossed away. Right? He always does. The problem is this movie is hilarious for the wrong reasons. He's a jilted... So, once again, 
uh, let's just get this out of the way. Sandra Bullock is now dating a guy named Alex Shaw. Alex Shaw is played by Jason Patrick. She is still Annie, Annie Porter, and uh, he's lied to her and doesn't tell him her that he is a L.A. Police Department cop. And I want to say it's because of what happened between her and Jack in the, at the end of the like, between the movies. Now, I will say this movie decides that it's going to try to go big, go bigger than speed. And by bigger, I mean it ends up on a cruise ship. We'll get to that in a second because that's where some of the ridiculousness happens. So he's an, a cop, and he's chasing uh, on a motorcycle, chasing a vehicle that's got stolen goods in it. When he catches the driver, somehow in L.A., big city, Annie runs into him during her driving test and sees that he's on the SWAT team, and she's pissed because he lied, and he's like, uh, he, he told her he was a beach officer. Like, at some point, wouldn't she have been in his place? Like, you have nothing. How do you hide all that? But what, So right there, a little, little hilarious with... Definitely taking some liberties with, you know, stuff. So to make it up to Annie, Alex says, hey, look, I got you a surprise uh, Caribbean cruise on the Seaborn Legend. They're on the ship, and John Geiger, a former employee of the cruise, which... So basically, Geiger hacks the, into the ship's computer system. Again, not too far ahead of its time. This one came out in 1997. So hacking was kind of like something people talked about. Granted, it was always done in the wrong way. It's it, it's always like graphical and stuff when it's really all text based, but whatever. Anyways, um, so he hacks into the ship computer system. The next night, he sabotages the communication system. He kills the captain, and he blows up two ship engines. Then he calls the bridge to, and talks to the first officer, a guy named Giuliano. He says, "Hey, captain's dead. I'm in charge. I will give him credit as a bad guy." He tells him to evacuate the ship. As the ship is being evacuated, he starts stealing jewelry from the ship's vault. We're introduced to a girl named Drew. She's a young duff girl. She is stuck in an elevator, and there's also we also find out that there's a group of people trapped behind some fire doors that in a hallway filling with smoke, so they can't um, escape. So while Geiger was kind of being nice, saying evacuate the ship, he didn't think about the fact that things like that might happen. So we flash forward, or we go to another scene. Annie and Alex are attempting to get on the, the last lifeboat, right? Now, up till now, it hasn't been that bad. Remotely blowing up the engines, kind of, I mean, I guess he could have wired it somehow, whatever. You know, and that hasn't been that bad. I had an inside guy. They get on the lifeboat, and Geiger now has set the boat to um, just keep going. We find out later on he, he's targeting, he wants to hit an oil tanker with it. But for now, it's just going. And he, basically, he wants to take down the cruise line that fired him. He created the software, this is his baby, and then he was fired. So he's jilted, and he's angry, and he's a typical plot line for a movie. Again, nothing so far. The beginning, corny, right? Like, hilarious. Like, oh, you're going for your driver's test. Hey, look, I'm LAPD. Huh? But this part, not so bad. And it, I can't, I, you know, it was all right. So we, the lifeboat they're trying to get on, it, the winch fails. So they can't get back on, so they bring everybody back on deck. And then... um I don't remember exactly how, but Alex figures out that Geiger is who's controlling the ship. Because remember, Geiger is portraying himself as a passenger, so he's kind of hiding, you know, he's a wolf in sheep's clothing here. He goes after him. Him and Giuliano go to the to Geiger's cabin, and Geiger blows explosives up that are in the room. Because everyone's an explosives expert in these two movies. Keep that in mind. He's a software programmer and a, a, apparently an explosives expert. Now we're getting kind of corny. Like, okay, he blows up the room. Annie and another guy named Dante, they figure out that these people are trapped behind the doors I mentioned earlier, and they use a chainsaw to cut open the doors to, bail them, to let them out and help, help them escape. I don't understand where the, you, why you would have a chainsaw on a cruise ship. How? Why? Like, fire axe? Jaws of life? Sure. Chainsaw? A eh, bit of a stretch. But again, so far, not horrible, but you can see where it's kind of paralleling the original one, right? Like, they go, he, you know, pain blows, blows up and they think he's dead. They go to the room, it blows up. What does it look like? What, what does it look like? Okay. It's green, like a, um, like a spray deodorant can. I don't know. I can't see. Okay. It's a grenade. They, do, they kind of discuss stuff, and Alex tells the navigator to flood the ship and open the ballast doors, hoping this would show, slow the ship down. So if you flood the ballast tanks, the ship sinks a little bit, stays floating, but it makes it heavier. And if the doors are kept open, there's, it puts drag on it, so it should slow it down. Here's my other problem with this being a speed movie. Speed is in a vehicle doing 50 miles per hour. Speed 2 is on a ship, a cruise ship, that, to the best of my knowledge, 
probably doesn't do 50 miles per hour. It's not going to blow up if it slows down. There's no real reason it should be called Speed 2 Cruise Control. Like, it could have just been called Cruise Control or something. I don't know. It didn't seem like it really had a good tie to it. Alex sees Drew get out of the elevator, and he runs to save her. And at the same time, he notices Geiger leaving the vault. So now Alex is holding Geiger at gunpoint. Geiger, being the super genius he is, closes the, the fire doors in, front, between, in between them, and, you know, Alex loses them. We find out that Geiger designed the autopilot system. He's... Like I said, he's taking revenge on him, and he was fired because he contracted contracted copper poisoning. Now, I'm not really 100% sure how that would happen, being the designer of the... Uh, whatever. Escapes by using a grenade, because grenades are easy to come by. Now we find out that the, ta- the oil tanker is going to crash into this oil tanker. They do, they're do. they able to make it not crash into the oil tanker, and now is when the movie gets really h- hilarious in a bad way. I like bad movies, don't get me wrong. There's two movies I thought were horrible, at least parts of them. Under Siege 2, the last half hour or so, actually most of the movie, and this. Because now they they miss the tanker, they skim along it. The ship is heading for an island. It's heading for, it's heading for St. Martin. And, oh, sorry, before that, Alex decides he's going to dive under the ship with a steel cable, put it in the propeller, because this is safe, and should work right tangle the propeller up to cause it to stop in the meantime geiger realizes he's trying to do it so he jams the winch while alex is underwater it breaks off the ship and frees the cable geiger then takes annie hostage because why not now i would assume at the point at this point annie's really annie really needs to rethink her life choices they escape on a boat and alex and dante dante was the uh, photographer that helped um Annie, they go into the ship's bilge area and they use the boat, the bow thrusters, which is something that ships have now, and they are able to maneuver the ship to just skim the tanker. But now it's heading into a straight into a marina at, at Saint Martin, in a, you know, small Saint Martin town. Now it becomes ridiculous because now it crashes into this town and it keeps going. I mean, I sh- I kid you not, it goes for a while, like way longer than it should. Like, ridiculously, like, you remember in the movie Spaceballs, if you've ever seen it, how long they showed a ship in the beginning? Kind of like that. Like, ridiculously long. You know, here's the other problem, too. Why I think this movie is, quote, hilarious. I don't think the chemistry was there between Patrick and Bullock. I don't think the chemistry was there between anybody. And to be honest, I think the best acting in this was Defoe, because Defoe always plays a great goofball bad guy, or good guy, or whatever. And, I mean... Sandra Bullock did, was Sandra Bullock. She wasn't bad either. So now they, uh, let's see. I don't know. There's like a there's like a boat chase, and I think um, Alex takes a spear gun and hits the boat, and then he, he uses the rope and wheels, reels himself into the boat, and then they get into a plane that's like, a, you know, a seaplane, and he rescues Annie, and they escape from the plane, because the float, the, the one float piece falls and they're on top of it and they land in the ocean and Geiger's trying to fly over the oil tanker and he can't and he gets impaled on the ship and the, and the ship and the tanker, expl- the helicopter, or helicopter, the airplane and, and the tanker explode. You know what? I don't, even, I don't even care anymore. It's just not a good movie. And then it ends with him proposing to Sandra Bullock saying, would you wear this ring for a while? Honestly, same director as the first one. Action scenes were a little over the top, a lot over the top. Um, different writer, it just it just wasn't there. <laughs> it, it it's laughable. It's laughable watching it because you're just on you after watching the first one, then seeing this, it's hard to believe this is actually a sequel to that movie. I mean, there's been a there's been a few times. It, it's not it, if it, if it didn't have the speed name, it probably wouldn't have been as bad in the first place. Like rename you know, her character, and just make it its own movie. Then it might have been all right. But tying it to a movie that was actually pretty damn good, the way they tried to do is just, no. Just not not good at all. And I don't think, I don't know if they really ever say, Anna Reeves was initially supposed to reprise the role, but decided not to commit and was replaced before Jason Patrick. Yeah, I'm guessing he read this and was like, what the fuck? Most of it was set on sound stages. 
I mean, it's the other thing too, right? Like the original speed, like I told you the stunts were good, the special effects were good and all that. And part of that's because of the fact that it was filmed on roads. It was filmed at an airport. It was filmed, you know, all this stuff. This one wasn't. This was mostly sound stages. This was mostly, you know, and this was like nominated for well, oh, worst sequel by the stinker ceremony. It won that. Worst screenplay for a film grossing over $100 million, nominated. Worst director, nominated. Worst song, nominated. Worst screenplay, nominated. Worst director, worst remake of a sequel or sequel, nominated. It won that. Worst on-screen couple, Jason Patrick and Sandra Bullock, like I said. Worst supporting actor, William Dafoe. Worst actress, Sandra Bullock. I mean, it got panned, and it's well-deserved. If you want to spend, like, seven hours of your time one time watching three of the most ridiculously bad sequels ever that you're just going to laugh at how bad they are. Watch this under siege two and mortal Kombat two from the nineties. That's all I got to tell you. So, um, I don't know if I was too harsh on speed two and too not harsh on speed one, but if that's the case, take it for what it's worth. Um, love speed one classic movie, great movie speed two. Well, I'll put it this way. There's number third, right? Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope this is, you know, hope you watch Speed and not Speed 2. And this is Johnny Potoki from the Attack of the B-Movies podcast saying thanks for listening and goodbye. Do you recommend the infamous sequel uh, as a double feature with Titanic? Well, to be fair, <laughs> I'd rather we watch that than Titanic. but Right. It's just so hysterical. Like it, it does not work, and yet you cannot take your eyes off it. Just like a Fast and Furious movie. It's just Jason Patrick. He's a good actor, but he had no charisma with Sandra Bullock, who ha- had to come back, you know, for a paycheck. And William Dafoe is taking it up to eleven, and it's so weird. It's like he's getting revenge on this tech company that gave him like blood cancer or something, and he uses leeches to like take out the chemicals in his body. It's so fucking weird, even for a PG-13 movie. Yeah. But I mean, I can still have fun with it, especially because of him. You know? It's just kind of trashy fun. They're, it's just, it's very watchable, despite being very illogical. Very true. What would you like to see a third movie be like? And that's a tease. I definitely want to do an audio drama creation. Because <laughs> they turn it down and yet you know the audience wants to see him back in there there's some excuse to have Sandra Bullock and Keanu back I could see maybe like a hostage situation you know I can do something with that is this one of your favorite SWAT team movies of all time well there's not too many I can name of my favorites to be honest I mean I Um, remember someone doing a review of the 2003 movie SWAT and they noticed how the Colin Farrell character Jim Street felt very much similar to Jack and Speed so there does seem to be some of that same go get it attitude for an action hero nowadays before it gets back to the usual hostage takeover crisis. Oh. Yeah, I could see that similarity, especially with Farrell's character at the time. But Do you recommend the Blu-ray set that has both movies with the imported special features? Well, I can't say because I've never gotten that Blu-ray set. So, uh, uh, From what reviews I've seen of it, it's looking pretty nice. Well, I might have to try to get that then. At some point, mm-hmm. but I can't promise anything. It's on and off on HBO Max. It seems uh, it's pretty hard to goof up this movie. It's very well shot. <laughs> I'm sure they'll amazing. try to remake it at some point. I know there's oh, a too. Oh no! no. <laughs> oh, I know they're gonna try to. Trust me. You know Hollywood. Come on. Yeah, soulless Hollywood. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> Trust me, they're gonna try to, and they're gonna fail, as usual. So <laughs> that's oh, I don't want to live in that hell. Speed Two Cruise Control was directed by Jan de Bont, the same man who directed the original Speed, and once again, he shows a lot of energy and originality in his special effects. It isn't a great action movie, but it's a very competent one, and it gets the job done. I liked it. I liked it, too. I was a little nervous there with the way you started out. I thought you were going to knock this picture. Nope. Uh, Sandra Bullock, I think is, it's very smart that she's here in a more limited role. She's on the run. She's alive and sexy. And Sandra Bullock has said that she's been overexposed ever since Speed, that she said she was boring herself. She thought mm-hmm. the, And I think that, that 
there's a conscious effort to limit her in this picture. And also, talk about Jason Patrick for a second. You say he steals the scenes, but he steals them because he's a superior actor. He was in a wonderful film called After Dark, My Sweet, about seven years ago, and he's just really yeah, good. Yeah, well, it, he's a good actor. He's good in a new movie coming out later this year called Love and Death on Long Island, too, that was a big hit at the Cannes Film Festival. But, you know, she was the star, really, right. more than Keanu Reeves, of Speed. So you make a sequel, okay. and you have the same star in the sequel. Why not let her be the star? I, we want to see Sandra no, I, Bullock. No, I, I mean, is it good career management to hide someone and to give them smaller roles? I think it's. I think it's her. I, I think it's her sense of herself and how she's. I think that they were co-equals yeah, well, in the first picture. I don't picture. think she should have that. I don't, she, I don't like the premise that you're making. She was, but she was the discovery. She was the discovery in the first picture. That's true. And, and it's not good it's not career advice to her to say keep a low profile. We want to see her. We like her. If we don't want to see her, we won't go to her movies. But she's, if we go to a Sandra Bullock movie, that's who we want to see. This isn't a Sandra Bullock movie. This is an action picture with two co-stars, Bullock and, and Jason Patrick, and all three. The ship and the two actors are very no, good. But my point is still an excellent one. Only in your head. Follow us on the web on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The podcast is available on Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor, Apple, and anywhere else podcasts are available. Feel free to review our show and leave comments on any of those sites. Thanks a million for listening. It's a